And now it's time for learning more about our lives as students, our body as humans, and our future as happy, healthy people. The APU and AUV Podcast Network presents the Student Health and Happiness Podcast with your host Russell Freeman. Welcome, everyone, to our AUV Student Health and Happiness Podcast. My name is Dr. Russell Freeman. I'm a chiropractic physician from the United States and a professor of health science at AUV. And today, I want to talk about learning how to learn. Why do students go to school? Many would say it's for learning more, but is that really the answer? And what does learning really mean? Why does it matter? Are learning intelligence and being smart the same things? Can we actually improve or control our learning ability, our intelligence, our wisdom? These are questions that I have often wondered about, and we're going to explore that today. We usually most closely associate learning with school, a formal education, being a student. For some people, that's it. That's what learning is. But does that mean no school, no learning? Does it mean that if you are in school, for sure you'll be learning something? What's expected from school? Well, in elementary school, which is required, you learn to read and write and your number tables. In high school, which often can be interrupted for people in different situations, you get a higher level of reading, writing, and arithmetic skills, but more socialization and Interest and talent development will occur during these years, and planning for university and professional academic achievement is on the minds of most students, if not their parents. In university, you will learn more about critical thinking skills and lifestyle and social opportunities and exploring new and different things and experiences like independent living and thinking, values development, and preparation for higher education levels. And the master's level, you seek higher levels of academic accomplishment and professional standing. As a PhD, you will be more involved in research, publication, and dictatorship, <laughs> directorships, sorry. <laughs> and in professional career development, you're looking for career qualification and development, financial security, fame, greatness, and fortune. But is it true? Does school learning and success weave together like a rope that supports us through our life? Well, there's a science in a term called epistemology. It's a term referring to the nature and origin of knowledge of truth. It's kind of as linguistics is to language, epistemology is to learning. And there, there's four main bases for knowledge that are laid out in this doctrine of epistemology. Divine revelation, which is a message from God. Experience, logic and reasoning, and intuition. School is supposed to strengthen our logic and reason. And the process of completing an education along with life itself, is where our experience and intuition are developed. Do you sometimes feel like you're struggling to learn, recall, and apply the new knowledge that you are offered in school? I can tell you from my students and my experience, both teaching and as being a student, that students often feel like they're just trying to remember it for the test and trying to get through the class rather than being able to appreciate the knowledge and skills that they could be acquiring. So maybe if we understand what learning is, and more importantly, how you can improve this important and lifelong practice, you can become not only educated, but smart and wise as well. So let's start with defining what is learning actually. It turns out that learning is a noun and a verb, and they have the same definition, which is the acquisition of knowledge or skills through experience, study, or by being taught. Now, synonyms to studying are education, schooling, tuition, teaching, academic work, instruction, training, research, investigation. We relate all of these terms to school. But in truth, these are terms that apply to our daily lives as well. 
So many times classes are taught. You have to memorize a lot of information, whether you understand it or not. And this suffices as learning. But is it really? My answer is no. It's only learning if it's something that you can apply and use. So for most people, strict memorization through repetition is not an effective learning experience. It's not very satisfying either, and it's exhausting. Lessons of school versus lessons of life. Well, the lessons that we remember are the ones that we learn and apply from doing and trying, succeeding and failing, challenging, questioning, and learning, as well as from observation and the experience of others. In my personal university experience, this is what really influenced the person I became and what I remember the most and where my real thinking skills developed. Now, there's an intersection with some Asian philosophy here in that there's a term called the learner's mind that appears in Asian philosophy. And the learner's mind is a foundational principle of Asian philosophy and especially of martial arts. It's a consistent finding in people who live very long and prosperous and happy lives. You are never too old to learn, as the adage goes. And the more you learn, the more you realize how little you really know. There's another term in, call, in Asian philosophy, and it's called Wu Wei. You might call it in the flow. It means learning knowledge and practice that weave together, that you can access and use effortlessly without focus, without focus on yourself and without limitation. And you can see this in, in high-level athletes, and you can also see it with stand-up comedians and improvisation artists that lose themselves in their routine, and they're the funniest people that you'll ever hear. Mind-body learning is one of the lessons of life. Yes, it's true that your mind and your body learn together, and they share their lessons. This is called the limbic system. It's a mechanism in your brain that is where and who you are. And, and that's where these understandings exist. This is where you are, who you are, and your relationship to life itself. And this is where they interact. The three body-mind limbic levels include unconscious survival instincts like breathing and temperature maintenance, emotional and experiential memory like the time you fell into the river or were bitten by a dog, and logical or critical thinking. And this is the higher level in an area of the brain called the frontal cortex. And this is what distinguishes the human brain from other animals. Now, the connection between these three levels is why our emotions, our thoughts, our actions, and our reactions are what they are. Learning can occur and be shared by all three of these interrelated systems. It's why you can sit in a movie and get goosebumps because it, you relate to an experience that you're seeing, and it has a physical reaction to you. In our modern and rapidly changing world, cultivating analytical and system, systematic skills is still very important. But in addition to intelligence, what is really needed to succeed and be happy in life are critical thinking and problem-solving skills, street smarts, confidence in your intuition, these will ultimately determine your capability and opportunities to grow in our new world. Perhaps this is a trap that many students fall into when they focus on grades rather than learning and, and reflecting. I try to reinforce with my students the importance of a certain informational piece or a way of thinking and how it will actually help them in their lives. If they focus on memorizing and you end up really not learning much, but you get very tired and become unmotivated about school. And when I see that happening, I find it very disturbing and I realize I have to do a better job about teaching. For a student to be relevant to the real world when they graduate, they must be capable of developing fruitful and long-term relationships, strategic thinking, problem-solving, and act with integrity. That's a topic for another episode. But these are the most important things one needs to learn early and keep learning every day of the life that they are living. 
even if you are the billion dollar lottery winner, you still need these skills to be a successful person. If being rich was the best answer, then why are there so many rich but unhappy people? They don't seem to appreciate what they have, and they have often privileged children that are depressed and angry. It's a common thing in developed countries, and it's becoming true in developed in undeveloped countries or developing countries as well. So let's define some important terms so we can understand the differences. We're going to talk about intelligence versus knowledge versus wisdom versus smart versus clever. What are these terms? Intelligence can be defined as the ability to think logically, to conceptualize and abstract from reality. Wisdom can be defined as the ability to grasp human nature, which is paradoxical, difficult to understand, contradictory, and subject to continual change. Being wise refers to knowledge, good judgment, experience, and sensibility, as well as wisdom. You might call this the application of intelligence. And smart mainly refers to being quick-witted, a kind of intelligence where you come up with solutions quickly. Most consider smart people to be those with strong intelligence and the ability to make use of it. A good manager needs to be smart, organized, and prepared to prevent and solve normal issues that come up. But that's a little different than clever people. Being clever means that one is witty and knows how to work around difficult situations in ways that are not obvious or ordinarily thought of. There's a certain imaginative quality that comes with being clever. When one's cleverness is aimed at developing solutions, it can sometimes outsmart the smartest of all. Think about Steve Jobs, Facebook, Google, and whoever invented Post-its. Entrepreneurs are those who start a business or enterprise on their own, taking risks and responsibilities greater than salary jobs. They especially are better off being clever but at very least need to surround themselves with smart and clever people. Chances are that what they memorized for tests in school doesn't really help them much. But in the process of learning, questioning, applying, critical thinking, and invention, they become smart. They become wise and clever. Perhaps that's the way intelligence should really be weighed. Now, how do you learn the best? Does how you learn affect what you learn? Can you learn tennis, cooking, accounting, and computer engineering the same ways? While you can access information and unlimited amounts and sources online, can the link between the monitor, the screen, the keyboard, and your brain make you a smart and wise person? The technologies, economy, and the world are changing at a really rapid pace. Can we even learn as fast as society and the world are changing? Maybe we're going to need AI for that in the future, but that's not going to bring out the best in us as people. So what about studying? Is learning a destination or is it a journey? Is it a goal or a process? Is learning a stage in life? Or is it a lifetime activity? Study is the intellectual process usually associated with learning, especially in school. If study is going to be the principal learning mode, what are the most effective ways to study? And how do you know your best way of learning? If you know your best way of learning, whether it's visual, audio, tactile, experiential, or intellectual through reading and study. If you know these things, you can adjust your study materials and methods to your strengths and reinforce with other modes. For example, you can make an audio tape of your notes and then use flashcards and have discussions and testing with your study partners. You combine all of these techniques, which I did in my education, especially in my medical education, which was so difficult And it really was effective. 
I found that using a combination of techniques, like taking notes, reading them aloud, making audio tapes of key points, and listening while I was resting or driving, and most importantly, short study bursts, not long, drawn-out periods, short study bursts, followed by exercise or meditation or music to clear my brain and get it ready to learn some more. Also, studying and discussion with study partners was great. And that was before there was much easier internet tools for collaborating. I think that the internet can help collaboration, but it's not a replacement for sitting with people and your colleagues and going over information and testing each other. I really think that that's the best for my students. Do these things apply to everyone everywhere? Is Vietnam different from Australia or South Korea? Yes, they do apply everywhere, and they apply to everyone. So here's some tricks and tips for learning and memory. Now, there's many theories, and there's lots of tools and techniques and schools of thought that have been used and promoted, like speed reading or cramming, memorization, flashcards, and lots more. But what are the best practices for what I call high-impact studying? In other words, learning and remembering and being able to use the most information in the shortest period of time. Are long hours in front of a computer and, a, and books effective? Well, no, they're not. And research proves this. It's shown that there's a huge range of study time effectiveness and that the longer study times don't necessarily improve learning scores. So here are some of the best practices that are absolutely critical to study and learning efficiently. Here we go. Five ways to maximize your study results. Number one, you may be surprised, but it's exercise. Exercise improves brain function and performance, serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine release, which are very helpful for learning and being in the mood to learn. Exercise interrupts the cramming of information, which is very ineffective. You do before, you do at breaks, you do after. Even a few short bursts of exercise can recharge your learning machine. Number two, repeat, reflect, test, and discuss. The transformation of short-term memory into long-term knowledge occurs through repeated exposure and retelling of the information. So if you learn something, reflect on it, discuss it and use it, and turn it into long-term knowledge. I think that this is why my technique of making flashcards, making audio tapes, and writing notes physically, uh, those were three different ways of of learning the same information, and I think that they all complemented each other. The third is vary your study techniques. Identify and use your best modes, whether they're visual, audio, verbal, or whatever. Test yourself. Test your study partners frequently to really own the answers. Short, intense study bursts can be very effective. Study intensively for an hour, do some exercise, meditate, etc., and then go back to it a little, later, a little while later. And number four is about sleep. You need to get as much sleep as you can, eight hours if possible. Get a good night's sleep and also take a power nap or meditate in the daytime to give you morning and afternoon alpha brave wave alpha brain wave bursts. The brain waves and connections that grow with knowledge and experience are processed and stored during sleep and rest cycles. It can take the brain four days to return to normal from a sleepless night. So if you're cramming for your tests the last week of, of, of the term and every night you're staying up late and losing sleep, each night you study, you are going to be learning less and spending more time doing it. Keep in mind that as you organize your study time and finals during the week, that when, that your best learning occurs early in the hour and starts to drop off very quickly with long sessions. Better to line up a bunch of short burst sessions if you really want to have the most effective uh, learning and also be able to catch up on your sleep. The last thing is to be comfortable when you study so that your body produces dopamine. That's the body's memory drug. 
sitting on the bed with your back slumped and your head dropped down will lower your results and hurt your body. That is not what being comfortable by working is. Have a proper workstation. Make sure that you're not having pain from sitting too long or holding a bad body position. Take breaks frequently and exercise. Well, let's conclude this by talking about how wisdom-based learning, which is your experiences in life, and knowledge-based learning, which is your studies, are what are required for you to be a truly well-rounded graduate when you leave school. What is that? Well, a well-rounded graduate is an independent thinker, a seeker of knowledge, a problem solver, and able to turn a dream into a goal and a goal into a successful enterprise or result. Now, some of the responsibility to achieve the best results in learning and in life is carried by the curriculum and the teaching skills. However, some and maybe even most is the student's responsibility to achieve the best results in learning and in life. The most important tests that you as a student will have are not in class. They're when you push yourself beyond your comfort zone. Test your real limits. Try new things and new ways. Think and problem solve in new and better ways. Be open to change and seek examples of how to do, be, and think better. If you're smart, you'll be a lifelong learner. And if you do these things and become a lifelong learner, you will become wise and be an example and mentor to others. And you will truly be a success in school and a success in life. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for dropping by. Have a great week.